think that'll be the last time. <laughs> Get one of these stands. I'm so excited to be speaking tonight. Uh, whenever Daniel was introduced as the book we'd be going through, I, I started being like chomping at the bit because Daniel is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And uh, I just couldn't wait, but I took some vacation time in the middle, and I was really disappointed that I wasn't given a chance. I was like, man, there's no time for me to fit it in, but I can't wait. I really want my shot <laughs> to preach in Daniel, but God knows what he's doing because uh, he waited for just the right time uh, for tonight, for Daniel chapter 6. Uh, if you don't know me very well, um, and chances are you may not if we haven't gone down the nerd rabbit hole of talking about both history, ancient history especially. Uh, I have studied you know, philosophy a lot, but also I'm obsessed with astronomy, if you didn't know that. Uh, from the time I was a very little kid, I remember uh, my mom was going back to school. I think I was five years old, thereabouts, or six, and she was in an astronomy class. And she took me with her to the university uh, to be in this class. And I remember just sitting down after, you know, I'd been reading all my little space books on my own on the side, but now I'm in a real deal astronomy class at the age of five or six. And the professor begins writing notes on the board, and I'm just fixated on it. I start writing down everything, all the charts, everything he's writing down, I'm copying it. I'm writing down all the words. I don't even know what all of the words mean, but I'm matching them, matching the letters and the symbols. And by the end of class, you know, if you don't know this, my sister Brooke went back to school around, or went to school around the same time as my mom was going back was in the same class, but she didn't take notes. And so when we got home, she was like, Mom, I didn't take any notes. I said, use Chase's. <laughs> and she did. <laughs> and so from that time on, like, it just stuck with me, an obsession, right, in, in that way. So that by the time I was in university, I remember uh, I ended up at Texas State, and there was an astronomy class, and I wanted my science credit to be astronomy. There was, of course, biology and chemistry, all this other stuff. I didn't care about any of it. But the astronomy professor on that class was the most... Every single person on that campus wanted to be in this guy's class. So that every semester that I tried to sign up, I'd wake up at 6 a.m., ready, go, to try to log in and click on it. By the time I had clicked the button to join the class, it was full, over 200 seats full. And I did that for multiple years. If you also don't know about me, I was a dropout at one point. So I even went back to the same school years later in around 2014, 2015, and I finally after trying to get in that same class, had to go to the professor's office and say, I am a senior in my undergrad, and I would like to be in your class, and this is my last chance. Can you please get me in? And he did. I was like, thank you so much. I love the class, aced it, it was a wonderful time. And he told me about 10 years ago, you guys are really going to be excited about the year 2023 and 2024 for the eclipse. So my family has heard me say nothing but a total solar eclipse, total solar eclipse is going to come for 10 years now. Because I'm a nerd about these things, right? And you'd say, man, why are you obsessed with this stuff? I, I have a reason. And you know, God knows what he's doing because what's tomorrow? A total solar eclipse that I've been waiting for for 10 years. And the passage and the section of scripture we're in today fits perfectly into that. And I can't make that up. It's just only God could have foreseen that. So... As we ended chapter 5, there's something that I really wanted uh, to fixate on here that he reminded him of uh, before he took his kingdom away. If you look in uh, verse 21, it says, if I'm taking out a section, until he recognized that the most high God is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. And then, of course, when we get to the end of the chapter, so Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. Well, where's this guy coming from? And we know, as it set it up, that God's the one that's appointing this man. But do we know the details of this man, Darius? And why Darius? What is God's purpose in this? And then when we start to fret about all the people that are leaders all over the world, we should remember this verse as well. God appoints whomever he wishes to be over mankind. Trust in it. I think this will powerfully demonstrate how God works these things out. Philip, if you'd pull up the map for me. Again, I'm going to go full nerd mode tonight. You don't often get to see this side of me, but you're going to. 
If you look at the back of your Bible, there's a reason why your Bible has maps in it. It's very hard to keep track of all the names of all these places, especially when they were thousands of years ago. It gets confusing, right? Do you sometimes find yourself saying, It's like, yeah, that name, that word, right? It's tricky. But when we look at it here, right, a lot of what we're talking about is in this area here. Of course, we know where Jerusalem is, but who's this king of the Medes? Well, he was about right there, okay, what is modern-day Turkey on this edge. And where he was beside was the kingdom of Lydia. And beside that, the Ionians of Greece and then Sparta. And, of course, over here, you get Nineveh, Babylon, further down. Of course, Jerusalem, kingdom of Egypt. You have Tyre of Sidon, the ancient Phoenicians. You've got all this stuff going on. The Hittites used to be here. Most of the time you hear about the Hittites, but the only Hittite of note that generally sticks in our mind is Uriah, whose wife was Bathsheba, mother of Solomon. Interesting, that lineage, but they're wiped out. The Medes replaced them. And so you have this Darius, king of the Medes, right here in the middle of history. Of course, up here in the north of Turkey, you have an ancient city, which was found to be Troy. A funny thing about scripture is, or even in your Bible, sometimes there's mentions of places that history thinks they didn't exist. And the Bible was like, yeah, they did. And then later we find out, yes, they did. God's word is true. I feel like tonight, if you're not convinced, you will be convinced that not only is God's word true, it interrupts history, science, goes right to the heart of your life. Make no doubt about it. So, you might have heard of this ancient story of Troy and Greece fighting. They made a you know, movie about it, Troy over a girl, whatever. Whatever you want to think about all that stuff. This place, there's a famous book called Homer's Odyssey. And, you know, I studied all this stuff for school and the Iliad and all of this. And sometimes they want to X out the Bible from that. If you're in university right now or you were formerly in university or you have kids about to go to university you got to equip them with the Word of God so that when they're placed with all this extra history, they understand that the Bible's not out of it. It's right in the middle. You know that they don't know who the Danites were who fought in the Battle of Iliad, but they know that they came from the land of Egypt and were possible descendants of the tribe of Dan in their exile in Egypt. You know, there's another group called the Simeons, and they believe, if you remember, they were cursed because they were warlike, men of arms, They slaughtered a whole group after they took their sister, if you recall, that they actually had some falling out. And many of them, it connects back. There's a connection in in certain texts that the king of Sparta, ever heard of that place, said that he is a descendant. He's a brother of the tribes of Abraham. And they think possibly some of Simeon's group went to Sparta because maybe you didn't know, the Spartans didn't practice the same teachings as the Athenians. They didn't remember all of their old teachings, but they remembered that there was a great lawgiver, even though they fell into all sorts of idolatry. All of this will connect. All of this will make sense. Let's jump into the text. Okay. Chapter 6. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom, and over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one that these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. Why is this king afraid of suffering loss? We'll explain. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption, inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Isn't it interesting that Daniel was both faithful to God, holy, and managed to figure out a way to be as faithful as possible to the kingdoms of man? We know what's about to happen. This story's been told to many of us since we were this big. But as best he could, he didn't try to be a rebel without a cause. He served his God. And guess what? You know what I really like about the fruits of the fruit of the Spirit? What does it say after the end of it? Anybody? Against such things there is no law. If you practice the fruit of the Spirit, you'll find yourself 
just by trying to follow the ultimate lawgiver, that you might be fulfilling the law of mankind. But where it crosses a line, this is for all of us, whenever it crosses a line and it goes too far and it pushes us into a place that is counter to that fruit of the Spirit, you're to stand up. If you don't believe me, let's look at Daniel. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Can that be said of you? Can that be said of you? Can that be said of me? Whew. High bars. These are the type of men and women we aim to be. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. So that Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, that is, the injunction. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Can you say that with death at its door, you will continue to be faithful in your servitude to Jesus Christ at all costs? Do you have anything in your life that is so diligently done in the name of God that to have a single day's interruption would be to your detriment? Where is our discipline? I'm not excluding myself. Where is my discipline? Self-control is that last fruit of the Spirit mentioned. He had it. We need to get back to it. He knew what was coming. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? The king replied, the statement is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king. Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. Where did the king get this fear of his God? Has anyone in your life witnessed your faith to Jesus Christ to the point where they dare not get in your way? Where they understand, don't mess with that person. Jesus is with them. You know what? I'll tell you, I've been in some really hostile places. In fact, the trip I went on, I was in a hostile place. You know whose name I dropped real fast? Jesus Christ. And you know what I felt like afterwards? Good. And the guy I was talking to who... It was another country was trying to get me go down this path to go get some drugs or to get into some trouble. I said, nah, man, I got Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about my testimony. It shut him down so fast. He started talking about his faith in Christ. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? Jesus Christ disarms the arm. Even this king over everything. <gasps> Not Daniel. Anybody but Daniel. Continue. Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself 
deliver you. Can you have a faith so dynamic that even those who don't believe, believe that you're going to be saved? They may not feel worthy. They may not feel like they are, but they can see it in you. And they're like, well, if anybody is going to be delivered, it's going to be you. Powerful words coming from the king. You know, if, I don't know if you saw the title of today's sermon, but I remember telling Sandy, I was like, no, 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 don't call it Daniel in the lion's den or Daniel and the lion's den. There's a reason for that. I said Daniel and a den of lions. Why? Whose den was it? A stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. Does this not remind you of another man who is afraid to punish a man to death and seal him in a tomb? Didn't they put a seal on it? Do you see the parallels? The lion's den, the den of death. Don't unsee it. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting. And no entertainer was brought before him. And his sleep fled from him. Then the king arose at dawn, at the break of day, and went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near to the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? How did he know he was a living God? Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me. And as much as I was found innocent before him and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. It seems like this lion's den has been transformed to the lion's mouths. And God even has dominion over them. Have you ever experienced a moment that was so dire there was only one to save? Do you know anybody that might be in that place? We have to ask these questions. And we can't doubt that there are not people around us who are watching like King Darius, who have experienced so much leading up to this point that they're right at the edge. They can see all the proof and the evidence of God right there. They can address him properly as the living God, the one to be fearful of. See, sometimes we only look at the troubled and the lowly, but we don't see all the people around who are watching us in high positions, wanting something that we have. Maybe someone in this room is wanting something someone else has. They see a deeper faith in someone. You're troubled. Let this be a message that impacts you. May it sink in deep. May it drive us to action as it did for Darius. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. Notice he extracted lion's den. <laughs> now it's just a den. Taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. And no injury whatever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The king then gave orders and brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel. And they cast them, their children and their wives, into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions had overpowered them and crushed all their bones. You see, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Those who go in the den without him will be crushed and they will not rise up again. Not only that, oftentimes those who go into life without Jesus Christ often drag their families with them. Don't think it's just about you. It can be generations 
This burdens me too. I have got to walk right for the sake of my sons. I have to. Let it be a strong burden and a motivator on your life. Not only are people watching you outside, but our families are watching us. See, Darius then wrote to the peoples of all nations, men of every language who are living in all the land. That whole map we were showing earlier. Everywhere that his kingdom touched, right? I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Go ahead and pull that map back up for me. Again, how is this guy Darius so aware? I mean, maybe he saw the things that we've read earlier, right, with Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe. Maybe he was partaking in some of the other events that happened around this time. But again, let's keep this in mind as we look at it. Here's this guy in needs. How did this happen? Let's tie this into the eclipse, if we will. You know, this eclipse that's happening now, we've had many eclipses. The eclipse is tomorrow. The eclipse of 1919, right, came around the time of Einstein's theory of relativity. In fact, it proved something in his relativity that he was making a supposition about. It was a really pivotal time. 150 AD, let's jump way back, the longest eclipse for 5,000 years extending into 3,000 years happened. 71 AD, an eclipse happened. The Greek Plutarch first described a corona, which is what we'll be calling what we see tomorrow around the sun. All the way back in 150 AD, he saw this, right? Or 71 AD, I apologize. You know what was one year before that in 70 AD? The destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. By Titus. Interesting. Around 29 AD or 33 AD, there were eclipses that a lot of people speculate about around the time of the crucifixion of Jesus. They're not sure which it was, but there's mention of something, something happening around that time in the sky. A lot of them, that's why they date Easter around the time of April. They think it could have been around that time. You know, if you jump even further back, I'm going to skip the big one that I'm getting to. Go back to that place in Troy and Iliad and the Odyssey. The end of the Odyssey ends in a known eclipse that happened. When Odysseus gets home, there's an eclipse that we know happened for sure in 1178 B.C. But in 585 B.C., there's an eclipse that many of you may not know about. It happened right here. You know who was involved in that eclipse? Darius. That eclipse ended a war between him, his father, and the Lydians. His father died in that battle, and in the middle of a battle that had been waging on and on for six years, this is during the time that Babylon was here, one year before Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonians, Darius and the Lydians were interrupted by an eclipse that no one knew was coming in the middle of battle. And the men dropped their weapons and agreed to have a peace. It's called the Battle of Thales or the Eclipse of Thales, if you want to look it up. It's a notable point in history in 585 BC, the only known eclipse to just totally interrupt a war of such magnitude. But because of this war, the death of the king, who was point, appointed king over the Medes? Darius. And he was given the bride of Lydia, a princess of Lydia, and the son of which, years later, and the daughter of which, was given to a man of Haran, Persia, who would have a son named Cyrus. So a man is made king who's not going to be made king because of an eclipse. And because of that, when the fall of Babylon occurs, he is here. He is here for this time, 
with Daniel, to do what happens with Daniel, to make way for the king Cyrus, who allowed the Jews to do what? Return to Jerusalem. You know what? Later, Cyrus makes a mistake and invades that same group, Lydia, who actually invented coinage, the use of coins, who worked with ancient Greece and sparked the war that Xerxes would later get into with Sparta, sending Alexander the Great to go all the way back around again and fulfill the prophecies of Ezekiel in Jerusalem. What if there was no Cyrus? What if there was no eclipse? What if there was no Darius? You know, my mind automatically goes to, yeah, it's just astronomy. It's no big deal, right? You know, that whole den of lions things, you know, it's the law of man. It's the law of the Medes and Persians, right? They were accounting on the judgment being passed by lions. But they didn't know the lions belonged to God. You know, the laws of physics, most of these physicists, including Newton, never thought to think that the laws of physics are the laws of God. If you go to Genesis 1, 13, well, 14 really, let's start there. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning a fourth day. Chase, why are you talking about this? When you see that eclipse tomorrow, keep in mind that God's time, God's laws that he set in the heavens that govern us and make amazing things like that happen, that's the real clock. It's a clock that mankind is desperately trying to keep up with. I could take you down a rabbit hole. I don't have time. If you want to go into physics later, we can. But you know, the whole thing with the leap year, which we just had, was just a way for us to try to keep up with the year because it's not consistent and constant. 365 days in the year was the best we could get. And then we have to add a leap year. And, and you don't do it when it's, not, when it's divisible by 100, but you do do it when it's divisible by 400. And you can only have three leap years in 400 years. And you can't do it. See this watch right here? It's chasing after the stars and the moon and the sun and the heavens that God laid out. It's desperately trying to keep up, which is why I got to wind my watch, because the laws of God govern it all. And he appoints whoever he wishes. If this stuff doesn't prove it to us, I don't know what will. But tomorrow when you see an eclipse, don't think, oh, mankind, we're so great. Look, we knew an eclipse was coming. You should see God and understand that, man, you laid this out. You knew this eclipse would be here now when you laid the foundations of the earth. You know, and, and again, it's just an eclipse. It's just going to be a few seconds or whatever, right? Not that long. Yeah, maybe a minute. Right? And, and it said, you know, he appointed all the stuff for seasons and times, right? But also for signs. You know, and if I can think of a better day for you to get your life together and give it all to Jesus as a way to remember it by, when did you do it? Oh, yeah, by an eclipse that won't happen again for another couple hundred years. You don't need stuff like that. But I feel like God put beautiful things on the earth, things that can't be explained, marvelous things on the earth to remind us that he's God and we're not. Be humbled by it. Understand that he's been doing this for a long time and will do it for a long time into the future. And what are you going to do with your life as short as it is on this earth? We should say to him, O king, live forever. I invite you tonight, 
Do you feel challenged by this in any way? If you need to come to the altar, if you need to pray down here, if you need to talk to somebody, if you need to prep, if there's somebody else out there you need to talk to, feel free. Use this eclipse as an excuse to say, you know, God's been doing this for a long time. A great grouping of scripture to show what he's been doing. But don't go away tonight not being equipped, right? Because the word of God equips us. It should be equipping us to action. We're not supposed to just sit passively by. We're supposed to do something. What is it for you tonight?